Department. Call our next case, Spady v. Bethlehem Area School District. Good morning. May it please the court. Good morning. My name is Audrey Copeland on behalf of the appellant, Carlton Rogers in this case. And I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal if I may. It's granted. Thank you. Your Honor, the relief that we request in this case is that this court vacate the order of the district court which denied summary judgment on Mr. Rogers' claim of qualified immunity. Mr. Rogers was a physical education teacher in this case and he was sued along with the school district and other individuals. The other ones were dismissed. Let me ask you a question here. Judge Slomski said that even though the second prong of the inquiry is a question of law, that is, was there a clearly established right here, the court's unable to do it without knowing whether a constitutional violation occurred using the Supreme Court authority in Curley. But the Supreme Court in Pearson said that the district court can look at whether a right was clearly established without deciding whether there was a constitutional violation. So should not the court have looked and asked that question? Was there a right clearly established? And how do you pass that test with respect to what happened here? Well, Your Honor, we feel that the district court erred by not looking at the second prong. Okay. And how is the right? First of all, what is the right here? And then how was it clearly established? Well, Your Honor, again, I think this court has also said that the court need not first address that first prong, which is whether or not there was a constitutional violation. They can go to the second prong. No, but I'm asking, you're asserting a constitutional right, whether or not there's a violation or not. And we have to decide whether it's clearly established. So what is the right that you're contending was clearly established? Well, I believe when you look at the plaintiff's case and the plaintiff's complaint, that the right, I suppose, is identified by the plaintiff, is whether or not the gym teacher, Mr. Rogers, was on notice that his alleged conduct at the time, which would be in 2010, which is alleged to be a failure to properly supervise his students' activities in the pool, would be a constitutional violation, or his failure to identify and to respond to the specific harm that the plaintiff alleges. And that harm alleged by the plaintiff is the danger of aspirating pool water into the lungs and suffering what the plaintiff claims the cause of death was, delayed or secondary drowning. And we submit that the state of the law at the time of this conduct was not such that it would put a reasonable person and the gym teachers put him on notice that a constitutional right was being violated. I know that Your Honors have not addressed that many school athletic cases, the most prominent being a non-presidential decision in Hinterberger. And in that case, this court reversed the denial of summary judgment and qualified immunity on that second clearly established grounds. That was a case involving a cheerleader and the coach was, the state created a danger case probably against the coach, apparently for not putting proper matting down before teaching the cheerleading squad a new stunt, which ended up in one of the cheerleaders being injured. And this court actually decided that on several grounds. And I think that those are very much relevant here. Although non-presidential opinions are non-presidential opinions. That's correct, Your Honor. But I think it's persuasive. Are you familiar with the Supreme Court's decision yesterday in the Taylor case? Taylor v. Barks? I'm 
I'm afraid I'm not. Was it a school case? It's not a school case, but it's a qualified immunity case. Is it? Involving the question of whether a right was clearly established or not. Judge Hardiman had dissented in our court and the Supreme Court agreed. We had a bad day in the Supreme Court yesterday. We were reversed in two cases. Except you had a good day. I was 50-50. Well, I was on the other panel, too. I was 50-50. It was a question of clearly established law, and the Supreme Court said we were viewing that a little bit too liberally, whereas in presidential opinions we said we might have been looking at it too narrowly. But it said there has to be something there for something to be clearly established. Well, I know that I planned today to cite what I thought was a very recent Supreme Court case from May 18th, but apparently it's not quite as recent as I thought since there have been a few more weeks intervening, and that was a Fourth Amendment clearly established case. And in that case, it was the city and county of San Francisco case. Oh, okay. In response to Judge Rendell's question, I'm not sure I understood your answer, unless your answer was, frankly, I'm not quite sure what the right is they are asserting. Is that your position? Well, I guess we'll have to ask your colleague. Well, I think I tried to be as specific as possible as to what the right is. You quoted several things from the complaint. Well, in other words, it is. Is your argument it could be any of these things, but regardless of which one of these it is, none of them was clearly established? Well, I believe that they're both assertions by the plaintiff. I mean, I think it's essentially a failure to supervise the gym class case, the gym class being conducted in the pool in this case. But it has to be a right of the individual to something, a right to bodily integrity or a right to not be sent back into the pool if you say you can't swim or a right. But it kind of is difficult to decide whether that it's clearly established or we can't figure out what it is. Well, again, the right, as you say, not to be sent back into the pool if you say you're ill, that ultimately results allegedly in a secondary, the rare phenomenon of a secondary drowning incident. So I think that's the way to look at this case. Would you urge that we would decide the clearly established prong ourselves as compared to sending it back and telling Judge Slomski that he can look at that first? Well, the district court did say that it was an issue of law, and that's obviously why we're here in front of this court, because the issue turns on an issue of law, so therefore this court has jurisdiction. And yes, you can, because it is an issue of law. But there are facts in dispute, though, right? I mean, this record is questionable. I mean, apparently he was a non-swimmer. You concede that or do you not concede that? And that was known to the gym teacher. He was a non-swimmer. We're not sure how often he's in the shallow end or the deep end. There's allegations that he was working his way around the pool along the sides. I think this actually has ended up being fairly well clarified, and I think it's relatively undisputed. First of all, I would say that any of the disputed facts that the district court identified as being disputed, they go to the first prong, whether there was a constitutional violation, and the district court said that himself. We're also saying even taking these facts, even admitting it for the purposes of summary judgment argument, even saying that he was ordered back when he was ill, even saying that he aspirated the chlorine in the pool water, even saying that he perished or died of this rare phenomenon of secondary drowning, that we're still entitled to qualifying immunity based upon this clearly established prong of the test. And again, the district court identified the factual issues, but only as to that first prong. We also argued that first prong in our brief because as a secondary argument, we believe that there was no constitutional violation. But you don't have to reach that to decide qualifying immunity in this case and to grant it in favor of the PE teacher. And going back to Hinterberg, even though we of course all understand it's not precedential, it did give a very interesting analysis of the case law at that time. Hinterberg was a 2013 case by panel, not precedential, and it involved a 2004 accident with a cheerleader. And what the court did was it looked at the case law in effect at the time, and there was nothing in effect dealing with that particular finding a state created danger under those circumstances. But it also looked at the case law that had happened subsequent to the accident up until 2013. And it also found that, again, there was no consensus. The case law was muddled, and the fact that there was no consensus also 
showed that it wouldn't be reasonable for someone in that person's position to believe that he was wrong. Would you agree that the test here is, would it be clear to a reasonable teacher that ordering an ill non-swimmer into the pool posed an unreasonable risk of harm? Well, to the extent that it should be clarified that this is not a drowning case. This is not a near drowning case. It's not a pool accident case or anything like that. This case doesn't involve the general risk of drowning in a pool. I think we have to assume in this case, at least at this point, while it may be disputed, that this is a case of dry drowning. Well, that's a different point. I think, yes, but for summary judgment, secondary drowning. But it's not a case where someone is struggling in the pool, has swallowed water, is gasping. One of the things that we point out... All right, that goes into my question about what kind of teacher should we be looking at in terms of making this judgment about a reasonable teacher. Is it a reasonable teacher who is acquainted with providing somebody with proper instruction on how to swim, or is it just any teacher? Well, I would point out that this teacher did take an American Red Cross life-saving course. But had no training on how to teach somebody how to swim. Right, but again, Your Honor, the swimming aspect really had nothing to do with this because the plaintiff's case is based upon an alleged incident where the young man apparently... One witness witnessed the young man go underwater for what she described as one second. A bunch of people bumped into a bunch of kids. This was in the shallow end of the pool where the individual could stand. And all the witnesses, and I think it's undisputed that the GP teacher never required them to go over their heads if they couldn't swim. And they knew he couldn't swim. There were other non-swimmers in the class. Would the result be different if he had drowned in the pool, under your view? Well, I just think it would be entirely... It would just be a different analysis. Obviously, but I'm asking the question to try to help us decide this case. Well... Wouldn't the gym teacher have an obligation to jump in the pool if there's a student in distress who's drowning in the pool during gym class? And I would say it would all depend on the circumstances. If you can see someone drowning... It's a question of deliberate indifference and what rises to that level. And then I think you're going into the clearly established. No, you're going to the first prompt. You know, what was his conduct under the circumstances? What was his training? And that. So, in this case... Well, that's the issue here, too, whether there was deliberate indifference under the first prompt. Correct? I'm sorry? Whether there's deliberate indifference is at issue here under the first prompt. Well, I suppose in a more general sense. The question is whether the state of the law at the time on state-created danger cases, which would, I guess, ultimately look at some of those issues, was such that he would be unnoticed. And it was not. All right. Thank you. Do you reserve rebuttal time? I did reserve three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. Stephen Amici on behalf of Appellee Micah Spady. Due process clause of the 14th Amendment, right to bodily integrity, is the answer to your question that you asked earlier, Your Honor. Right to bodily integrity. How does someone invade the bodily integrity of this student? He was a student in Mr. Rogers' class. He was a swimming student. He had a right to go into that pool and learn how to swim without drowning, Your Honor. He didn't drown. Yes, he was a victim of secondary drowning. Can I take just a moment and explain what secondary drowning is? I think we know what it is. You explained it well in the brief. Could I take just a moment? No. Okay. I mean, well, you can do whatever you want, but I think we're going to have questions for you that might help you prevail on that one, at least for me. I'm on your side on that one. Okay. But where I question you is you cite Curley v. Clem for the jurisdictional analysis here. It's a 2007 case from our court. But Saucier v. Katz was overruled by Pearson v. Callahan, so do you not concede that it's appropriate if the district court so chooses or if this court so chooses to evaluate the second prong of the test and skip over the first prong? Very good. Your Honor, my understanding is Curley, I believe, gives the option if the first prong is muddled, as it is in this particular case, the facts are disputed, that there's no need to go to the second prong. And if I may quote from Curley, it says, Curley v. Clem, 
from clearly. Well, you would say there's no need, but from the standpoint of the state actor who is being forced to go to trial, the whole point of qualified immunity is to say, we're sparing you a trial unless, uh, you know, certain factors can be shown. And so isn't it really for a court, if they're considering whether qualified immunity applies, they have, you really have to look at whatever might provide the out, if you will. And if the law is not clearly established, are we, is the district court to turn a blind eye to that and make the state actor go to trial even though the law is not clearly established? But when the facts are closely interwined, Your Honor... The facts I, are not closely interwined been, with the clearly established problem. Tell me what case should, would tell this teacher or any reasonable person would put them on notice that, oh, there's a, there's a problem here. I've, I've got to do something. So okay, tell me yeah. what law, okay, what, in your what honor, case. There, there's no case on secondary drowning or dry drowning. There's no case on all fours on that. Okay, but what's your best case? Well, Your Honor, reasonable... Um, I mean, we've got to say it's clear. I thought you were relying on Knight v. Tedder. That seemed to be your lead case. Yes, Your Honor. And, and that's the case where the, the where woman was intoxicated. Yes, with her and, husband they sent the, and, and they sent the woman the, home unattended right. where she fell asleep. They put her in a much worse position and, and, they, and they found her. An affirmative right. act. Right. Yeah. And a reasonable police officer would know that what he was doing was unlawful right. by placing her in a position that had he right. done nothing at all, she would have been in a much better place had she not been. And Mr. How Rogers, they, and how would a sir. reasonable phys ed teacher know that a student that spent a second or two or five underwater and then got out of the water, appeared fine, was at risk of dry drowning? Your Honor, he didn't appear fine. He had pain in his chest. He, wouldn't go to, he refused the opportunity to go to the nurse. That's disputed, Your Honor. That's Mr. Rogers' side of the story. We have, it's in the brief, Your Honor, we have three students that said he wanted to sit out and that Mr. Rogers told him, you either get back into the pool or we're going to dock your grade. That was before he went underwater for the second testified by the student. Say that again, Your Honor. As I understand the sequence, he was told to do that. He went back in, and then at some point he went underwater thereafter. Then he got out of the pool, then he went to class, and then the poor young man had died in, in class, correct? Uh, class my class. understanding of the facts, Your Honor, is that he did his gutter grabbing around the perimeter of the pool. We all understand what gutter grabbing is. Yes, I don't have to explain yes. that. And while he was gutter grabbing, he released himself from the edge of the pool, went under momentarily, pardon me, ran into a group of students, went under momentarily, came up in a panic with at least one student stating that she saw him aspirate water or thought, felt that he aspirated water, immediately went to the side of the pool, got out of the pool, informed the PE teacher that he wanted to sit on the side of the pool, didn't want to swim anymore. Uh, Mr. Rogers told him he could sit there. He sat there for, I believe, somewhere between 5 and 15 minutes where Mr. Rogers re-approached him and told him he needed to get, instead of sending him to the nurse, told him he needed to get back into the pool at that point and continue swimming. So while he was in the pool, dying as you may, he, he had to go back into the pool at that point. All right, but let's, so, let's get back to the clearly sure. established. And if you haven't read Taylor versus Barks, it really, I think, creates a problem for you uh, because there the Supreme Court says the Third Circuit concluded that the right at issue was best defined as an incarcerated person's right to the proper implementation of adequate suicide prevention protocols. You can figure out what happened here. This purported right, however, was not clearly established in November 2004 in a way that placed beyond debate the unconstitutionality of the institution's procedures as implemented by the medical contractor. No decision of this court establishes a right to the proper implementation of adequate suicide prevention procedures. No decision of this court even discusses suicide screening or prevention protocols. And then it goes on to say, well, and if there had been 
if the Third Circuit had clearly established, which we had thought we had, assuming for the sake of argument that a right can be clearly established by circuit precedent, I mean, the Supreme Court is really making this very restricted in terms of what has to dictate the result here. That's an excellent question, Your Honor. Let's talk about the procedures that Bethlehem School District did not have in place at the time. No, I'm not talking about the case law. No, I'm not talking about case law either. I'm talking about what procedures that the Bethlehem Area School District did not have in place at the time. The focus isn't on Bethlehem School District. It's on Mr. Rogers. Okay. Well, Mr. Rogers, first of all. You've got a claim against Bethlehem School District. Well, Mr. Rogers, not only was he not familiar with the symptoms and what to do in the event of secondary drowning, he didn't even know what secondary drowning was. His student lifeguard was permitted to lie on her stomach on the bleachers while the students were mixed, swimmers and non-swimmers, in the pool. Mr. Rogers taught from the deck in street clothes, unprepared to go into the pool to make a rescue if he needed to do it. But that's not what happened here. That's not what happened here. The problem, as I see it, Judge Rendell is quite right about reading what the Supreme Court said. They're being very critical of the circuit courts and the district courts in this way. The lower courts, according to the Supreme Court, have been defining the constitutional right at a high level of generality. That's a phrase that you may have seen in the case law. And you stood up here and you said, right to bodily integrity. And that sounds good. It makes sense. We all see the justice in that. But when you read all the case law, that sounds like precisely the kind of high level of generality that the lower courts are consistently getting reversed on. But isn't the real question, Your Honor, that of would a reasonable gym teacher in Mr. Rogers' position know that what he's doing is unlawful? Sending a child who is telling him, I'm feeling ill and I don't want to go back into the pool. A child who just ran into somebody and went underwater, aspirated water, didn't have any body system in place. Nobody to, nobody, and he sends him back into the pool under threat of lowering his grade. You're talking about the first part again. Yes, I understand that, Your Honor. And I'm challenging you. I think the panel's challenging you. You're probably in good shape on the first part, at least at this stage of the litigation. But you're running into perhaps a brick wall in the second part. What is the clearly established right? You need to, before you can answer the question of whether Mr. Rogers is acting unlawfully, you need to establish what the law requires. What is the constitutional right? Is it the right not to suffer a dry drowning? Is it the right not to be sent into a pool when you are not a good swimmer? You know, what is the right? It is the right, Your Honor, not to be sent into the pool when, it's the right not to be sent into a pool mixed in with swimmers and non-swimmers. The Supreme Court would then say this purported right, however, was not clearly established. And be specific as to this right of not being sent, able to be, having to be sent into the pool was not clearly established because that's what it's requiring. Or is it the right? We identify exactly what it is and say, oops, it's not there. But then aren't we opening the door for any case where there's not a case specific on point? We are. And the Supreme Court is closing. What it seems to mean is you have all kinds of causes of action, perhaps, negligence, battery, assault, all kinds of common law causes, but you just don't have a constitutional tort. That might be the answer. Or you have a constitutional tort against the school district. May I reserve my time, Your Honor, for rebuttal? There is no rebuttal for you. Only your opponent will get rebuttal. Okay. Does the Court have any other questions for me? I think we don't. I think we're good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Copeland, you reserve three minutes. 
Thank you. Your Honor, I just wanted to address, address the timeline just very briefly. And I know that the plaintiff's key witness with regard to whether any incident occurred was Ms. Williams. And her testimony can be found at the appendix starting at Rule 175A. There's a sworn statement and a deposition. And according to her testimony, any incident occurred after swimming laps, which would have been after any of the gutter grabbing, when he actually was in the shallow end of the pool trying to swim in his fashion across the pool, bumped into other students, and at least according to her, might have gone under for a second. So it had nothing to do with him being ordered back into the pool after the incident occurred. That would have occurred before the incident. And also with regard to the training of Mr. Rogers, the American Red Cross Lifesaving Course, a secondary drowning wasn't part of the curriculum then. I don't know if it is now, but it wasn't then. So it wasn't just plain ignorance. He took the course and it simply, it's a rare phenomenon as the resources that Plaintiff also cited indicate. And again, I think as we know, there was no rescue needed. There was no, there was a left girl present. He was present. However he was demonstrating swimming is irrelevant because, again, there was no rescue needed. And he simply allowed the non-swimmers to be in the shallow end of the pool and tried to demonstrate the arm motions so they might learn how to do those. All right. Unless the Court has any more questions. No, I think not. Thank you. Thank you very much. The case is well argued. We'll take it under advisement.